Good afternoon and welcome to the Racial Reckonings in the Future of the Humanities Conference Director's Roundtable on Institutionalizing Critical Race Studies. You're welcome to send any technical questions or comments to the host through the Q&A panel located at the bottom of your screen. Questions for the speakers should be put in the Q&A panel as well and will be answered at the end of the session if time permits. This session is being recorded. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and um, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are coming from. Uh, my name is Atto Kwesen, and I'm a professor of English at Stanford University. And I have the very, very happy uh, position of uh, moderating this magnificent session. Let me start off right away by welcoming you all, but and then also by um, giving just brief uh, introductions to the various uh, uh, directors and thus speakers. Uh, first, we have Jennifer Devier Brody, who is professor in theater and performance studies at Stanford, where she serves as the faculty director of the Center for Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity. In other words, she's my, my colleague. Hi, hi, Jennifer. Uh, uh, Stephen Pitti is the director of the Center for the Study of Race, Indigeneity and Transnational Migration, and a professor of history American Studies and Ethnicity, Race, and Migration at Yale University. Hi, Stephen. Uh, C. Riley Snorton is the Interim Faculty Director at the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture, and a Professor of English and Literature and Gender and Sexuality Studies at the University of Chicago. Hi. Uh, Tricia Rose is Chancellor's Professor of Africana Studies and the Director of the Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity in America at Brown University. Hi, Tricia. So uh, we open with uh, Jennifer. So Jennifer, over to you. Thank you so much, Otto, and uh, colleagues here. It is indeed um, an honor to be part of this collective and this conference on racial reckoning. I'm speaking to you from the unceded Mwekma Ohlone homelands, an acknowledgement that only begins to reckon with the reparations required to repair the damage of centuries of racial capitalism that calls upon us to exercise, in Teresa Montoya's words, radical vulnerability. In yesterday's panel, colleagues spoke eloquently about the reorganization of knowledge, power, savoir pouvoir needed to transform the university. As the recent news about the daughter of the African family in Philadelphia's MOVE program, uh, whose bones were used without consent for a lecture involving my alma mater, University of Pennsylvania and Princeton University, often known as the South's northernmost institution that sits on the land of the Lenai Lenape, and also where I was born, um, has shown universities have trafficked for many centuries throughout the Americas uh, and in uh, Europe, um, in the bones of the ancestors. And so we're thinking here about a reckoning of bones from the Americas to Auschwitz to gynecologist Marion Sims. And that's a shout out to Riley Snorton who's written with such moral clarity about Sims's uh, transgression with the bones of the dead and the living. Um, and so our bodies and our bones have been used without consent in the name of knowledge that benefits what Rod Ferguson yesterday talked about as a professional exercise in benchmarks. Indeed, all the panelists yesterday shared their concern, which we're going to continue talking about today, about how to work more ethically and equitably with the putative objects and subjects that the university hierarchies produce and sustain. And I think that really is our um, focus on critical race studies and its institutionalization within the larger uh, understandings of knowledge. So in my nearly 30 years as a professor, having taught at seven universities uh, in many different departments, English, African and African-American studies, gender and sexuality studies, performance studies. Um, I have often looked to not only other scholars in critical race studies, um, which uh, you know, was really organized in the 1990s by a group of critical race and legal scholars, um, but I've also looked to artists whose work intervenes in the restricted governance of racial order. In preparing these short remarks, I had too many examples of contemporary scholars and artists 
um, black and brown, those who work for civil rights, feminist art, ACT UP, AIDS, anti-war protests, the prison against the prison industrial complex, indigenous rights, police violence, farm workers unions, disability rights, Occupy, trans justice, anti-nuclear protests, uh, the demonstrations against the World Trade Organization, the Bay Area's People Kitchen Collective, I could go on and on, um, but to choose from to people who are working to uh, quote the motto of the People's Kitchen Collective here in Oakland, and I, I do some work with them, to feed the mind, nourish the soul, and fuel a movement. And I'm pointing to them in part, not only because they do amazing work on uh, recreating, for example, the free breakfast in Defemory, Little Bobby Hutton Park, in homage to the Black Panthers, but to try to get at this idea of what kinds of care or caritas that the university in its Cartesian claims to specific forms of rational thought too often elides, um, right? And so I'm thinking a little bit of Charles Mills's work here on the racial contract, on the whole sort of history that organizes Western knowledge that puts those of us who are working in the margins around critical race studies, right? At, um, uh, and want to transform that knowledge in a slightly uh, oppositional or complicated space vis-a-vis traditional forms of understanding uh, what counts as thought. So these academics and artists that I've mentioned begin to try to break down some of those barriers between theory and practice and Marxist terms of praxis um, and intervene in university structures that institutionalize a hierarchical division of labor between scholars and researchers or artists and practitioners. Something that the center where I work now for comparative studies in race and ethnicity at Stanford has tried to di dismantle by asking uh, practitioners, for example, working on ethics, race, and technology to come into the university and teach us and get us to think differently about the knowledge that they produce in their own spaces of work. And similarly, in theater and performance studies, uh, we have tried to tenure artists. So what counts as you know, the book or what is tenurable um, begins to be undone. And I'm trying to talk here a little bit about the segregation of faculty, not only from students, but of you know, different kinds of valuation of what counts as uh, the imaginative creative dimension of scholarship. Um, and, you know, again, I joined a long, long list where Tim Spillers has talked about this in her classic essay on Harold Cruz's The Crisis of the Negro Intellectual. Um, how is it that we want to value the different subjects and different ways of knowing? right, in the university that can maybe go against certain enlightenment legacies that erase and devalue embodied work, which is concomitant with the mind-body split where disabled working class, female and racialized others weren't necessarily seen to be thinking human subjects. And this matters because part of the current racial reckoning asks us to change the quote unquote face of the university and such a shift for me must not only be quantitative, but also qualitative. We must not just change the color, but also the content of academic culture, redo the syllabi, uh, reorganize academic apartheid, to use Dwight Conkergood's phrase. At Stanford, we did just finally hire two artist scholars, uh, Young Jean Lee among them, whose play Straight White Men was the first produced by an Asian American woman on Broadway. And like Toni Morrison, we hope she'll be the first tenured creative artist uh, in our program. We can see that also um, uh, what happens to the extra diegetic, I'll call it, labor that too many of us uh, scholars of color are asked to do on the behalf of changing the face of the university. I'm talking about all of the uncredited uh, uh, and unpaid, if you will, um, uh, labor to diversify the university, right? How does that get accounted for in questions of who is valued and what is valued as forms of work under the university rubric? We can see that a whole scale cultural, economic, and political change is required to begin to achieve racial justice in the university. In my own work, I've spoken about the difficulty of having inherited a segregated academy that makes thinking about historical connection, 
connections, Micah's Blacks in Britain, and I think Noemi talked about this yesterday, um, that made that unintelligible in the narrow confines of academic knowledge. So again, let us remember that racial justice cannot be achieved by numbers or any one metric alone. As Jeff Chang says, when you choose to fight, you hope it will not only be merely for greater numbers, but rather for more power in those numbers that can lead a way to equity, unquote. So this is uh, why Adrian Davis and her colleagues who just founded a center similar to the ones you'll be hearing about from the other faculty directors on this um, uh, um, meeting called the Center for Race, Ethnicity and Equity. So it's E2 there at Washington University. And this is a new center founded in 2020. And there are a lot now being founded across the country. Um, so our centers that you'll hear from today with my colleagues on the line, um, we you know, met first as a collective of directors of such centers. And I think one question we have for the audience and we wanna discuss is what is really the value of these centers? Um, Davis notes that without students, we would just be a giant think tank. And I wanna just take a moment to give credit to the student activism that helped to found my center 25 years ago through a hunger strike. And that continues with the founding of so many of the work on uh, expanding questions of race and ethnicity, whether that's from SF State 50 years ago to the present where we continue to see new groups. Um, I'm getting ready to close my comments. And in doing so, I just wanna take a moment from uh, a colleague we met, I think Steve was on the line, all of us at, at uh, University of Washington, St. Louis with Adrian Davis, where Chandra Ford, who is the founding director of UCLA's Center for the Study of Racism, Social Justice and Health, made the very important point um, that when she established that center on Indigenous Peoples Day, she sought to integrate critical race studies lens with public health initiatives. Um, and though I think most of us here are in the humanities, I wanna to point to the really uh, breadth that critical race studies can bring to reorganizing the entire university. Um, and to also bring up a point Chandra made where she talks about combating liberal forms of racism, which can be overshadowed when we focus on the spectacular everyday violence um, that we have seen, of course, really every day, uh, and especially over the last four years, if not four centuries, um, that if we can fail to interrogate the power differentials that organize the university uh, that are seemingly benign, but I think no less pernicious in forms of, of racism. So we've seen a lot of um, you know, university administrations give a little statement around whatever act of heinous uh, and spectacular violence occurs, but really not necessarily look to how do we change those institutions that in which we exist, whether the police, the prison, the hospital, or the university. To be sure, it appears that universities across the country are, are grappling with this legacies of displacement of a native of enslavement and the nef nefarious forms of profit, which have brought them into existence. And we can think about Ruth Simmons, the first black woman president of Brown, leading the charge to try to uh, think about reckoning and recompense, recompense, sorry, for um, enslavement and indigenous uh, 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 profits at the university. Or even at Stanford, we've just taken down the sculpture of our first president, David Starr Jordan, who was a eugenicist who took part in the Racial Betterment Society. But the renaming and the removal of such vexed figures of violence still leaves us in our centers, uh, vulnerable to displacement, troubled by remainders and yearning for greater equity across differences. I hope that these um, opening remarks draw, that draw from critical race theory, interdisciplinary studies, feminist studies, black queer studies and the like, all my disciplinary formations, help us to sound a call to action, to mobilize compensatory redress, to respond to precarious citizens past and present, and to reckon in the bones with racial injustice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Thank you so much. So Stephen, you go next. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Thank you for your leadership. You know, I, I just admire everything you've done there so much in recent years. And um, as somebody who has been shaped in some way by the center you run. I'm just grateful for um, your vision that you've brought to the place in recent years. So greetings everybody from New Haven, um, the historical and contemporary home of, of many indigenous peoples and nations, including the Mohegan, the Mashantucket Pequot, the Eastern Pequot, 
the Scaticoke, the Golden Hill Pogasset, the Niantic, the Quinnipiac, and others, uh, where we in um, the Yale Center for the Study of Race, Indigeneity, and Transnational Migration try to work mindful of their presence in its many forms, contemporary and in the past. Um, I'm going to speak in a little bit of a different mode than Jennifer just um, offered um, uh, and talk a little bit of what, about the specifics of our center as a way to get part of this conversation rolling. Um, I direct the youngest center represented here on the panel. Since we founded uh, RITM at Yale in the winter of 2016 and have just completed our fifth anniversary, the other centers represented here are uh, uh, longer in the tooth, more established than that. Uh, being established in the second decade of the 20th century as we were, gave us at Yale the opportunity to think for a while about what kind of an academic unit we actually wanted to create, that institutional contract that Rod Ferguson talked about yesterday. And we had some luxury in building on the great work already happening at places like Stanford, Chicago, and Brown, uh, and being able to alert our administration as we made the, uh, the effort to create a center uh, that they needed to uh, enable our work in establishing a race st uh, study center here in order to keep, st to keep step with uh, my colleagues on this panel and uh, those their places and so many other places. So as with every other comparable center I've ever heard about, Yale Center uh, was a product of political pressure, uh, as well as hard intellectual work and compromises with and by the administration. So here's our story. A small group of faculty members on our campus, including me, uh, first began to meet and develop the idea of uh, what became the RITM Center in 2007, roughly eight years before RITM was in fact established. Those faculty were in departments like African American Studies, American Studies, History, uh, Women, Gender and Sexuality Studies, and our Ethnicity, Race and Migration Program. No real surprise that those were represented. All of us were faculty of color, our faculty of color. Uh, all of us were cross appointed in multiple units and had interdisciplinary interests and struggled to meet the, the needs and the expectations of our various units. We were frustrated by failures to successfully hire, recruit and retain faculty members working in fields like Latinx studies, black studies, native and indigenous studies and Asian American studies. We all felt that students interested in those fields at Yale were intellectually underserved by our university in the 21st century. We all felt anger about the paucity of faculty of color on our campus generally. So in short, we were unhappy. Uh, we had watched as valued friends and colleagues were not promoted uh, or, were, uh, or left our campus for other seemingly more hospitable colleges and universities. And we felt tired in the 21st century, tokenized on too many com committees, trotted out sometimes as showpieces when convenient conscious that our students were not receiving the education that they wanted and needed and trapped too often in debates with our administration that we could not escape. So that was the situation around 2007, 2008, uh, still somewhat familiar today, I'm sure to many people uh, in this meeting. And it was the situation that led us to ask for a research and teaching center that would both first dignify studies of race and intellectual engagements with core issues in ethnic studies and related fields as topics of studies, but also as, as prisms and parameters for approaching these topics. And secondly, a place that would provide resources and space and a hub, perhaps a catalyst, to advance the interests of members of our communities and serve as a magnet for attracting and retaining people interested in race studies. So the second point is important because we felt fractured and divided and isolated in separate departmental spaces on our campus. And we also knew that there were just far too few of us doing the work. We were then able to actually create the center in the 2015-2016 academic year when Yale undergraduates uh, pushed the, our administration um, to address uh, campus climate and faculty hiring uh, and our undergraduate curriculum. Uh, we faculty members had this center proposal that had been sitting collecting dust in our offices from a few years before, and we were already ready to make that um, to make that suggestion. So we took the center proposal to our president and our provost who approved the general plan. And, but I must underscore what Jennifer said, it would not have happened were it not for student struggle and student support. In my final minute or two, let me just close uh, quickly with a few notes about our focus uh, in the RITM Center and some of our struggles, just to put these on the table. First, 
you should know that we focus to date more on graduate students than on, on undergraduates on our campus as a research and teaching center. Uh, while undergraduates, it seems to us, um, still need much that they're not getting, by comparison, graduate students have had far less structured support on our campus um, as emerging scholars. And because we in the center wanted to shape research, we've therefore put the emphasis uh, in terms of our funding and our programming more on MA and PhD theses and related projects, major projects, than on the support of undergraduate um, classroom exercises. Second, in RITM, uh, as at, at Stanford, we've tried to work across the entire university throughout our professional schools, as well as in our faculty of arts and sciences, but also in our university museums and in our theaters and in other parts of our institution. Uh, this has been rewarding, uh, but as you would imagine, also challenging. Uh, and that's worth talking about the scope and scale and how to get that right. Third. Uh, we've tried uh, in our work to amplify ongoing work uh, at the university in various departments and units while also developing new work that's not yet able to be amplified because it doesn't exist yet in uh, more under-resourced areas. Uh, I'm thinking, for example, we've tried to uh, co-sponsor events and visitors and uh, uh, and efforts through departments that are already doing this work. But we've also tried to bring units together that don't talk to one another or haven't traditionally done that. And we've tried to focus attention and resources on topics related to race, indigeneity and transnational migration like native and indigenous studies or Latinx studies that have had less pull in established departments. For example, there is no department there. There is a department of AFAM. So we've tried to support AFAM while also putting resources and developing um, areas that don't have institutional support elsewhere. Fourth, we've successfully um, uh, helped to bring undergraduates to Yale as undergraduate students and also doctoral students to Yale into small departments over the last five years. The undergraduates who we've, whom we've helped to recruit have come in part through an awards program that we've run for high school students around the country who are interested in RITM topics and doing social justice work in their communities. And we've been part of that recruitment process. The graduate students who come to Yale um, at our encouragement have often come because we offer them in our center a home outside of the smaller department where they can, uh, and our home is one in which they can fully engage topics related to race in ways that they may not be able to in their home department. And our center is a place where they can be assured that they will see more scholars of color than they likely will in their small humanities or social science department where there are often far too few of them. So that's been a, a method of recruitment as well, or we've had some success in recruitment for that reason. Fifth, we've been more successful, I think, I, 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 on reflection, I think we've been more successful at gathering graduate students across units than, get, than gathering faculty across units who don't already know one another. In fact, we've struggled with consistent faculty participation in our center, uh, partly because faculty remain so tied to departments. Our untenured colleagues, of course, need to be present in their tenuring units. Our tenured colleagues already serve on so many committees. So our efforts, unfortunately, often just invite more work from our faculty, uh, our, our faculty colleagues. Yes, we'd love for you to do that conference. Uh, just tell us what you wanna do. Well, that's more work. Sure, we can help with that expense. Please fill out this form and send us your receipt and so forth, more work. Uh, you know, Would you be willing to serve on a prize committee for the center and so forth and so forth. Um, sixth, and uh, finally, we've managed, I think, to be somewhat catalytic across campus in the spaces I've described, uh, bringing funding and what I do think of as some kind of dignity to subversive efforts in, in various parts of our campus, or perhaps they're better called creative efforts or efforts at greater accuracy or something like that in different departments and programs. So while we may not always um, capture the attention of large numbers of faculty, we have tried to be strategic um, in helping faculty who wanna do interesting and important things uh, in ways that aren't being supported in their units to do that work. In fact, we've had some of our greatest success in supporting non ladder track faculty on our campus who are working on RITM topics. We've been able to provide them some research funding that they wouldn't get otherwise. We've given them opportunities to share their research with one another, uh, and we've organized writing groups for them that are often not available in their home departments. This may sound like small stuff, 
uh, but it actually dignifies the work of people who are otherwise being treated as um, contingent labor all too often on our campus and elsewhere. I'd say the same with our efforts to engage with other, some other people on campus who may not be at the top levels of their institutional hierarchies. Some of our most creative curators, for example, or artists scattered around the university who may not have uh, 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 the checkbook um, that gives them the full funding that they want, but that we can bring um, uh, some of our funding and some of our support to help them realize their vision, particularly visions related to reckoning, which after all is the topic of our conversation today. So I'm gonna stop there and pass it on to my colleague. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Stephen. So Riley, you come next. Yes, yes thank you, Eto, and thank you to Jennifer and Stephen for their brilliant remarks. Um, it's such a pleasure to be in conversation with my colleagues at the Center in Race Consortium, and it's my privilege to work with the incredible staff at the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture, Tracy Matthews, Marilyn Willis, Jacqueline Gaines, and Tiara Kilpatrick. As an opening statement, I want to provide some of, some of the context and a sense of the day-to-day -day of the Center's activities as a way to ground some of the intellectual, political, and ethical work as I see it. I also want to acknowledge that the University of Chicago sits on the tribal homelands of the Council of the Three Fires, the Odawa, Ojibwe, and Potawatomi nations, as well as other tribes. And as the sixth largest urban native community in the U.S., Indigenous people continue to practice their heritage traditions and care for the land and waterways. The Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture, CSRPC, was established by my colleague, Michael C. Dawson, uh, Professor of Political Science in 1996. And from its inception, CSRPC has been committed to establishing and sustaining a space to center and expand the study of race and ethnicity at the University of Chicago by fostering interdisciplinary, transnational, and intersectional research, teaching, and public debate. So at the center, we understand that race and ethnicity affect every idea and interaction, and we work to foster meaningful dialogues about the myriad ways race and ethnicity inform our lived experiences and scholarship. The center is committed to providing funding and other forms of support, like many of my uh, colleagues working at other centers, for projects that are initiated by faculty affiliates, graduate students, undergraduates, artists and residents, and visiting fellows. And I'm especially proud that this year, in addition to our ongoing artists and residents program, which we've been doing in collaboration with Arts and Public Life, that we welcomed our inaugural practitioner fellows in conjunction with the Posen Center's Human Rights Lab as part of their fellowship. Each practitioner is designing a project that explores an aspect of the carceral system. By doing this kind of work, we continue to strengthen community relations with the South Side and Chicago as we continue to act in solidarity with local, national, and global struggles for racial, ethnic, economic, gender, sexual, and social justice. So in addition to providing funding and other forms of support for scholarship, overseeing an undergraduate major and minor, hosting residencies and visiting fellows, sponsoring workshops and working groups, uh, which include the reproduction of race and racial ideology workshop, the race working group, which is a graduate led and graduate only space, the mass incarceration working group, uh, and the race and pedagogy working group and the slavery and visual culture working group. The center supports and sponsors a number of public programs geared toward promoting an investigation of the ties between race, ethnicity, and culture, often in collaboration with student groups, other campus centers, and academic units, as well as community based institutions. This is the day to day work of the center. And yet, we are also ethically and mor morally compelled to be responsive to our current environment, to provide forums for activists and scholars, to give context and share strategies for combating racist, sexist, homophobic, and transphobic injustice and violence. Unlike some of the other schools in the Centering Race Consortium, the University of Chicago does not have a department devoted to the study of race and ethnicity. However, through the commitment, through the committed work of some of CSRPC's faculty affiliates working within the More Than Diversity campaign and in solidarity with years of organizing from UChicago students, with UChicago United, and particularly Ethnic Studies Now, the Grad Student Union, and the Black Grad Student Collective, there has been some progress made on that front which allows for us at the center to begin to engage in the related process of imagining a renewed center that works alongside an emergent department. Uh, 
And I'd like to pause here, uh, but we'll be happy to return to some of these issues later, as I think this moment at the University of Chicago allows us to think about reckoning on a number of registers, and perhaps also to consider what comes after a reckoning. Thank you. Thank you so much, Riley. So uh, Tricia, you're next. Thank you, Otto. Um, thank you, my dear colleagues, members of the CRC. It's been great working with you and fantastic hearing you here and planning this event. Thanks for everyone who come, who's come out on this, at least in my part of the country, rainy day. Um, I'm, I'm going to try to focus my comments on um, a broader set of questions and problems that don't entirely always dovetail with my own center, but when they do, I'll, I'll certainly emphasize it. Um, and that has to do with what I would call the, the sort of consequences of the legacy of the formation of race centers. And, um, you know, I, and, you know, all of the centers represented here have tremendous faculty support and amazing work comes out of these places. Uh, you know, graduate student investment, so on and so forth. So I'm not in any way di disparaging that level of, of intellectual investment. But what concerns me is the degree to which that work uh, is, is undermined by the very structures that uh, force us into the placement that we're in. So I want to talk a bit about that first. Um, the formation of the centers uh, that study race and ethnicity broadly in the United States almost always emerge from uh, student protest first and foremost, um, and, and everyone here mentioned that at one form or another, either in the past or in the present. <laughs> I was like, no, it's an it's a ongoing project. Um, but I wanna say a little bit more about what that student activism is about because um, it often becomes a touchstone, but it's a very important part of, uh, of the critique of disciplinary knowledge in the university. Students uh, eventually, uh, students of color of various uh, types come to the university only in the last 50 years. And they realize that the, the structures of knowledge, in fact, are not in any way designed to shed light on the histories of the groups out of which they come. And that kind of protest is usually focused specifically on demanding that the curriculum provide significant educational um, uh, um, you know, sources for them. And in addition, it's a challenge to the role of universities, the social protest is a challenge to the role of universities in the given town, in a given city, and its role in <clears throat> being a sort of, um, not in alignment with social justice movements in the street and in the public sphere. And so it's an implicit critique about the role of race in the discipline. And, and that's why this notion of institutionalizing critical race studies is such an important part of the, of the framing. It's not simply to study race because that was actually going on every once in a while, but in ways that was actually reproducing the very problems that we're talking about. Jennifer talked a bit about this at the outset um, in terms of anthropology and so on um, and objects. Um, so um, I, I, I just wanna really put the work that we're doing in the context of disciplines that are sort of structurally hostile, even with, even in the cases when you have, you know, well-meaning faculty members in those departments. I'm not making a, an argument against every academic in a discipline in the United States, but I'm more saying that I think it's really important to talk about the, the institutional tension that's, that's there. Um, the space of centers on race, it seems to me, are really developed in the interstices uh, of the university as a whole. That there's a very little space that is cracked open and we, we endeavor to inhabit it, to give it life, to figure out what's needed in our particular local circumstances. Um, but that process does result in a number of things that I think are exceptionally important. One is that it's a it's a it's built-in fragility, and that fragility is registered in lots of different ways. Uh, it's registered in terms of funding and support, space, uh, whether or not centers or in, or interdisciplinary spaces can be homes for tenure-track positions in all or in part. Um, it's about whether or not it can be seen as a valuable and important part of the university 
and its forms of knowledge production. And that matters a lot for whether or not faculty from other departments can be involved safely and uh, professionally. Um, it's understaffed. Um, and then it's often, frankly, you know, trotted out. And this is over and over again across 50 years, trotted out at, at you know, the crisis of the decade or the crisis of the year to sort of hold and be the center of discussion. Um, now, you know, I will admit at Brown, I've had tremendous support for the center during my tenure, but CSREA has been around since the mid 1980s, 1986. And for a lot of that time had extremely limited support and was in many ways starved of the necessary resources to do a number of the things it wanted to do. It, however, was a very successful uh, incubator for the ethnic studies concentration at Brown. And so that's been a very important advance that happened before. But, you know, the level of work that it takes to, to keep this, you know, crack open for all of us is very significant. And it not only requires the immense work of, you know, our colleagues who donate their time, as Steve was pointing out, to various endeavors, but it means that those of us who direct them aren't simply directing, you know, in, in, in a climate of sort of, you know, presumed value and dignity and significance. <laughs> one, one has to perpetually explain the value and significance and why. Um, even in cases when centers for race are placed in campaigns for endowments, which is extremely rare, but even in the cases when that happens, one has to explain over and over again what one does and why it's a central relevant issue. Uh, and why would any white people want to give money to this, for example, which I, if I could tell you how many times I've had that conversation. So for me, this means that the reckoning is not so much about more centers and more sort of the repetition of the structures that we're in. It's really about a, a, a fundamental uh, challenge to the construction of race and the marginality of race to the thinking and the framing of the vast majority of traditional disciplinary knowledges. And that can't just be adding on a section in the curriculum or adding on one course. It has to be a very significant uh, reframing of what these disciplines are about, perhaps a dismantling, which is what my colleague Matt Gutterall was talking about yesterday. Um, but I think this reckoning uh, can't just be at, you know, sort of hoping students are going to protest enough to expand more attention or that um, that will be able to, you know, have a friendly administration, right, which, you know, would be lovely and, and in my case is, but what you, what, what I think the reckoning really has to be about is a, is a real fundamental infrastructural intellectual challenge to the whole enterprise to say that if you think you can do discipline X, and not fundamentally think about race, gender and sexuality, uh, indigeneity and so on as significant parts of how your discipline was either shaped or how it's functioning now, then you're not doing the work you need to do. It has to be that level of, of racial reckoning, in my opinion. Uh, otherwise, we will be in very much this same position 25 years from now with a next generation of brilliant people who will replace my brilliant colleagues here and for sure me, and they will uh, say very much the same thing, maybe with different academic language, um, but they'll be in a very similar position. And, and that ultimately is a stabilizing phenomenon, right? So that our fragility, our underfunding, and yet our constant repetition of protest and inclusion and so on. And so it, it's a dance of repetition that I think doesn't change the outcomes in significant ways. Um, and so I just want to I want to end with um, with, a, you know, a real challenge that um, we don't necessarily want to blow up our centers. Right. But but there's a sense in which our demise has to be part of our plan in that we have to imagine that departments can be so fundamentally changed that we would be part of that change rather than keeping this this tension between uh, margin and center. Uh, in terms of the disciplines. So I'm going to stop there because I know we're, we're mm. been talking a while, but I'm looking forward to our conversation as a whole. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tricia, and to all the uh, panelists. Uh, this has been uh, magnificent. Now, I have a set of questions to ask to open up uh, debates, and, and, and I have the questions here, but I'm going to pose one of my own. 
that I fabricated as I was listening to you guys. And it has to do with, uh, to put it very simply, the problem of proposition making in interdisciplinary studies, because all these centers are at heart interdisciplinary. Now, what do I mean by the problem of proposition making? I am in an English department. Now, in an English department, and I'm sure that Riley will, will, will see echoes of his own department, uh, English uh, at Chicago, in what I'm going to say. Uh, Shakespearean, and what I'm going to say now uh, aligns specifically with Shakespeare and medieval studies. A Shakespearean to, to make a proposition on Shakespeare for it to be salient in the field of Shakespeare studies will have to master several languages. Uh, Latin and Greek well, among them, we also have to master different discourses, you know, medical history, uh, you know, sometimes even music and so on. But one of the signature features of Shakespeareans is that they're etymologists. They like d diving into the meaning of words in Shakespeare. There's no serious Shakespearean who doesn't know something about etymology for a very simple and practical reason. The language of Shakespeare is over 450 years old. Now, if you shift from the medieval, and the medievalists are also similar. Uh, if you shift from medieval uh, studies and Shakespeare studies to say post-colonialism, my own area, our protocols of proposition making are different. They are more advocacy oriented. They are more, uh, you know, shining a torchlight on inequality and colonialism and so on and so forth. Our, pro our protocols of proposition making are so different that it is not unusual in English departments for Shakespeareans and medievalists to think that they're in completely different uh, departments and concerns from say Shakespeareans. My question is then this, what are, so this is back to what Tricia said about the, we should contemplate the demise of our, or the non-existence of our various centers of ethnic studies. What would it take for the protocols of proposition making in anthropology, in sociology, in English, in the various disciplines to admit race as an aspect of proposition making? And this is not simply about looking at race, because you could look at, look at race and still not uh, change the way that you make your propositions. So this is a question about, um, about um, intellectual paradigms. Uh, it's not merely additive. It's not merely, let us talk about race now, but it's about the more, so, so for example, as a post-colonial, I talk about race completely differently from how a Shakespearean or even a classicist that talks about race uh, because this, this, it's completely different because the genealogies of the idea of race in the classics are different. What would you, so this is my invitation, for you to give some, some to lend your thoughts to the problematic of proposition making in our interdisciplinary uh, race and equity, uh, CCSRE and so on, but in relation to how our protocols of proposition making might make sense within the individual disciplines. So this is my question to start with. We can start from uh, uh, the same uh, order of, of uh, speaking. So Jennifer can, can respond. Just briefly, and, and I do think it's a related question. You know, my father was a social scientist and he used to say that my questions began where his ended in terms of uh, being a quantitative person. Um, and my greatest, uh, I think, discussion that we would have of precisely this question um, was when he was writing a long chapter on Galton's theory of G in psychology and uh, had the good fortune to put in at least. And of course, this was taken up and this was a racist idea. Galton was a eugenicist, right? And he said that had he not uh, been in discussions with me over time, that that would have been a quote unquote irrelevant detail to explaining um, you know, how that uh, term worked. And similarly, even with Shakespeare studies, I know you know the work of Kim Hall and we were talking about this yesterday, 
um, even in terms of, of etymology, you know, Peter Stolly Ross was actually my dissertation advisor, who was in a Shakespearean, very much interested in etymology. Um, but where that takes you is not just a classical myth, um, but to very key terms, such as what is a blackamoor. Yeah? Um, and so we are always, I think, already uh, engaged, even the very notion of an English department, right, with, you know, England. Uh, and the English language, right? If you really get into it in medieval studies, this was come up, came up yesterday, Geraldine Hang's work, or that really opens up again to a global world in which race is uh, produced discursively. And I think it was Noemi yesterday was talking about the fact that, you know, who is asking the question uh, can sometimes change the very notion of uh, what is important to know which is kind of what I was trying to say. And I think that it speaks also very much to everything everyone has said here. Um, and, and Trish was saying, you know, that what would happen, right, if we completely change uh, what we think a university is for, whom does it serve? What is this about? Why are we engaged in this kind of work? And we've seen this with the increase of the global university. And I think that that's why that term reckoning, which is also talking about um, the, the distribution of funds and sources and value um, is so important. Mm. Thank you so very thank much. Thank you for that question. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, Stephen? Yeah, I, this is a great question. Thank you. You know, there's so much to say on this. Um, I think I'll just try to, you know, keep it relatively simple and say that, you know, I think it is, to me, I always come back to words like you know, dignity and value, which Jennifer and, you know, Trisha and I think Riley and, and, you know, everybody uses very commonly. You know, I, I think to me, it's about um, enfranchising points of view, um, dignifying those points of view, allowing formations uh, and understandings um, to, um, to take center stage in university-wide and societal um, conversations, but actually um, minoritize or diminish the prominence of kind of narrow, uh, historically rooted, but narrow kind of ways of thinking about problems that are very much departmentalized. You know, one in one, you know, I'm fortunate at Yale that we, I actually work in a, in a university that we have certainly have a lot of problems around interdisciplinarity and um, recognizing interdisciplinarity, but we have some very uh, wonderful interdisciplinary programs and they have some, they have prominence. And I often say that, you know, many for, I'm a historian uh, and one of my appointments is in history, but I often say that many of our best historians on our campus are not in the history department. Um, and I'd like to see um, our students in history actually work with them uh, as well, even as they're getting their, their degree and their credential in the department to which they were admitted. Uh, I'm thinking mostly of graduate students here. So I think that centers can, you know, I, I think that centers can work in a lot of different ways. I, I think uh, I'm, I'm all for the revolution and I, hopefully working for it. Um, and I think that the, the idea of the, uh, the, 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 the withering away of departments, um, you know, is absolutely something to be anticipated and pushed toward. I also think that we make small gains in departments by dignifying people's work who actually very much identify with their discipline and want to see their future in a discipline in ways that I may not, uh, you know, I, I may, may not be the thing I think of as most productive. And yet, you know, we're talking about the kind of politics of small numbers, right? There's relatively few of us. And so I want to see our center, for example, you know, working with and helping move forward conversations that may be very disciplinarily bound and that I think may not be the long term. Um, ways in which we want to go, but that actually I think do bring value because I want that particular faculty member to prosper in their local department. And I know that if they're prospering, they're bringing a couple of students along with them. So I think we can do that work, which may be additive and not you know, um, revolutionary alongside doing the revolutionary work, which is more about um, privileging other ways of knowing, other methodologies, um, other connections that you know are um, different um, problems of proposition, as 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 you were you were you were putting them, and I think it's I think it's the challenge is to 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 be open to doing all of those kinds of work at once. And um, so anyway, that's where we are, I think, on, on our campus. And it, it leaves us sometimes unclear about um, next steps and priorities because there is so much work to do. Um, but we don't want to we don't want to foreclose uh, what may seem like the more cautious or more conservative approach. Um, uh, uh, because it's not, it's not radical or revolutionary enough. We want to think about ways to do all of that. 
Uh, thank you, Stephen. Actually, you just there's a line that you used, which uh, you know I was used to think a little bit more is enfranchising different points of view. You said this in your in your in your response, enfranchising different points of view. A whole lot of weight can be put to bear on the 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 question of how to enfranchise different points of view as an aspect of proposition making in the discipline because it's it's true in english uh, literary studies uh, they have historically not been very uh, open to enfranchising uh, minority points of view of which they are many even in the dominant text so the question of how to enfranchise different points of view is, is really important uh, riley please no, oh, thanks. Um, and I was also uh, really struck by that formulation. In some ways, it also kind of underscores how I think about what it means to do work at the center, which is that we are a space for maximalist approaches to race and ethnicity, that there are many ways through many modes that people are engaging in these questions uh, critically. Um, to that, and, and in, in concert, I hope, uh, with uh, the comments that Jennifer and that uh, Steve have already made. I'll just add that, you know, some part of your question is also making me think a little bit about some of the fields that I work in, for which the kind of matter of institutionalization is not settled. Um, you know, to be working in the field of trans studies uh, it is not really seen as having a particular uh, way in which a proposition might be made. And so I'm also deeply um, you know, interested in or have been hearing echoed throughout the, the course of the last two days, you know, the kind of provocation from Stuart Hall about what it is that uh, that it, for him, what cultural studies would do, to, for example, to a discipline like sociology, which is in some ways it was it was to to kind of cannibalize it, but in so doing to make it anew. And I think often, um, you know, sitting and being trained in interdisciplines, uh, you know, the work then becomes uh, 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 it's, it's obviously always still uh, rife with power, but it's it's also about a kind of project about legibility and audiences. I think, as as Jennifer mentioned as well, who are you talking to? As a kind of uh, uh, another note to Noemi, um, but I really appreciate the question as a, as an invitation to kind of think along these these um, these ideas. Uh, thanks, Riley. Uh, Tricia. Um. <clears throat> I guess I just have two additions to these wonderful remarks. Um, uh, the first is that um, you know disciplinary boundaries are somewhat arbitrary. Um, they have historical formations, but um, sometimes you have different propositional formations in the same discipline, and they're they're not necessarily limited because of it. What that means is that disciplines are you know, political skirmishes, right, really. Uh, they're the result of, of winning political skirmishes. And as such, they shouldn't be treated as gospel um, and they should be understood as being in, you know, transformational uh, formation of one form or another. So, so when you say, you know, can the protocols of proposition making that might come out of a, a critical race studies framework, you know, what, where can it be? Well, it can be in a lot of places for the reasons I said, right? Um, the second thing is that, you know, I, I totally wanna um, support Steve's initial point, which was, look, you do both and. You do all you have to do at this moment. Um, and, you know, we've been very fortunate to recruit some amazing scholars on Race to Brown in the last five to eight years, uh, who increased uh, the ranks of what was already a really amazing group of people. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't say, well, you know, we just got to burn it down. We don't do any higher and don't put anybody in a discipline. <laughs> I mean, I'm certainly not saying that. Um, but I just want to illuminate that when we accept the categories, when we accept the disciplinary structures and we allow the power that they hold over resources, right? There's no question. I don't think anybody on our panel would say like a history department is in, in, in any uh, jeopardy of disappearing anytime soon, right? Like, you know, not to pick on, you know, historians, but I, I could say a number of disciplines. And that fact is a, is a really important part of the problem and the circumstance that we're in. So what I'm really asking us to do is be not so much radical only in action, but in thinking about knowledge production so that we don't end up here again. 
And by here, I mean um, that, you know, amazing work is being done, but as a number of people mentioned, you know, there's fragility around getting tenure. There's fragility about what kind of work matters. There's fragility around what kinds of arguments you can make about race and expect to, to have the same type of career. And all of those things are part of the issue that brought our centers into existence in the first place. So I just, you know, you can't have it both ways. I, we can't have it both ways, it seems to me. And I just want to remind us of that um, as, we, as, we, as we think of, of how we want our centers to function going forward. Wonderful, Tricia. I like your line, disciplines are products of political skirmishes. That's a good line. You know, there's always a you can have it. <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's always a food fight happening. <laughs> no, I, I like this. These are all uh, wonderful comments. Uh, now, uh, th th now I'm going to to go to the uh, prompt questions that I have here, and the one that uh, fascinates me most is um, actually I'm I'm uh, doctoring one of them, which is uh, what has been the success. Or how do you think you might uh, operationalize um, uh, placing race and equity studies on the entire undergraduate curriculum? So everybody is interested, has to do something about it. Do you think this is uh, is just a, a utopia? Uh, or at, at uh, Princeton some years ago, they, um, they nominated uh, Anthony Appiah's book on cosmopolitanism, that everyone entering uh, Princeton that year had to read it, you know. Now, Appiah's uh, um, a theory of cosmopolitanism is one what one might describe as a, a gentleman's theory of cosmopolitanism. It is not anything that would, I think, uh, it doesn't poke anyone in the eye. He's, he himself is such a gentleman. So, but that's what the students read. And so they were all came out feeling completely cosmopolitan, but not in ways that would um, unsettle the very principle of cosmopolitanism uh, as such. So my question, so my question is, how might we, you know, uh, persuade our universities to make uh, race and equity a general concern across the campus? So that's my question. So st starting with, with uh, Jennifer again. Okay, and I, I hope we'll get to lots of questions too if there's some from the audience. Um, I guess I would just say that, again, what does it mean to read? Uh, because there are, I think, four books for the Stanford students this year. Um, one of them, I think, uh, Call Me By My Name, right? Uh, and they have over the years had uh, you know, Neil Jirasi Tyson's work um, and so forth. Um, but how is it, are those texts being read and interpreted, rejected or valued, right? Um, this is then at, at the heart of how also I think we need to transform not just what we teach, right, to go back to your example earlier of, of, of sort of Shakespeare, right, you can open that up to questions of race and equity, um, but, but it's, it's also how you teach it and, you know, and what that syllabi is, what's the method, um, uh, and what ultimately are you trying to change, and is it then also not just about um, how we read or what we read, but in what context, and again, I'll just say, you know, for, for whose benefit, because I think too often, even the way those books are selected um, have to do with still the larger problem um, that we have inherited of the university as a space, a la Oxbridge, of um, educating a liberal citizen already, citizenry always already um, self-segregated previously before, you know, we had EEOC or ways of diversifying when, you know, schools had their quota of Jew Jewish professors or Blacks like Du Bois were not allowed to teach at University of Pennsylvania. Yeah, that the very idea of, you know, the university student, right, is one that I believe is still imagined to be ideally, uh, you know, a certain, a certain type of person, 
And so that a whole idea of what is the liberal education for? I mean, I don't want to go too meta with that, but I, I think it's relevant, right? Again, whom do we imagine we are serving and, and how those books would even be interpreted? And then also the relationship between university and community. Because often universities are like, uh, they are elite pods, the elite pods of innovation. And some university departments have no interest in what is happening uh, uh, in the outside world. So also the relationship yeah, between what we do and the communities beyond. That's why uh, SRE has a lovely tradition of community engaged learning. And yeah. we have students do an internship, but of a particular kind where they're prepared to think about questions of um, community-based research and solidarity before they even go out into the quote unquote community spaces. All right, so uh, uh, Stephen? Do you have some yeah, sure, I can answer this question quickly, I think. Um, um, how, how could we have these conversations <laughs> carefully? I mean, I think that that's really an important principle. Um, you know, um, expertly, I think, is, a, is another one. They can't be, um, they can't be had on camp college and university campuses and kind of rambly and uh, ways without, you know, careful thought. And also in ways that are uh, and this is really important, I think, cognizant of the differential ways in which people enter and experience these conversations, right? I mean, for so many of our students, um, you know, they're, um, I mean, college is so different from for most of them from what they, they grew up with. Um, and those who we would uh, be, want to be very cognizant of supporting in these conversations can oftentimes take these conversations as very difficult um, and very hard. And, um, and the lack of support in these conversations for, for people who experience these issues directly and disproportionately um, can be very challenging. So those would be at least just so, without trying to get too much into the details, those would be at least three principles that I would wanna suggest ought to be, um, ought to be guiding um, any discussion of this sort. Wonderful. Uh, Riley? Thanks. And, you know, I, I'm really just struck by, I think, what are some of the great principles that have been put on the table. And I'll, I'll add, I think, just one more thing, which is really that um, and a kind of conversation, intellectual conversations about race are happening in places in which they are also being actively disavowed. And so it's also about uh, you know, providing a kind of way of seeing that what we are doing is engaging in racialized forms of thought. Um, that may be absented of what we see as a kind of legible understanding of a racialized body or how race plays out in terms of uh, discourses of race relation. All right, Tricia, yes. and, then, and then we'll open it up to Yeah, yeah, for questions. sure. Um, super, super quick. Um, you know, I think the way I would uh, encourage us to do, you know, a critical race studies uh, intervention in the curriculum is to remind our students and, and, and the disciplines to remind themselves that they are formed under a white supremacist, uh, colonialist infrastructure and ideological framework, all of them. And that that's not a sort of sub piece of the puzzle off on the side. It was a fundamental component, not the only one, not even necessarily the super most, most important one, although I think it ranks up there. Uh, and that that as a mode of self-interrogation, right? You know, you have to be willing to interrogate the self. That's a Western, you know, philosophical uh, framework from Socrates in the first place, right? You must interrogate the self in order to, to grow, to learn, to transform. So it wouldn't just be about adding courses or readings. It's about asking the disciplines to do the, the true self-interrogation that's necessary to understand why race is a central element in the formation of everything and the ways in which these ideas that were not about race on their explicit terms were all about race and control and space and who was a problem and who needed to be excluded from governance and who didn't, what mattered in the constitution and what didn't, so on and so forth. So the principles were great. We just added black people. We messed up the first time. We added them later. No, no, that's not what happened. So that's what I think is more important than anything uh, in terms of, you know, really um, to make in the kind of change we're talking about. Wonderful, Tricia, wonderful, you all. So now the, uh, the questions, 
Are we going to, Megan, are you going to um, read them out for us or you shall know, I? I? I can, I can do that. You can do it. All right. All right, please. Thank you. So let me, let me pose this question to all of us. You know, we have a question from this app from um, an instructor, I think, um, who is asking a general question about requirements in their fields. Um, and it, the specifics are about language requirements um, uh, that, that are required for the achievement of a degree that strike this person as um, perhaps outdated and potentially um, a kind of mechanism for predetermining the direction of, of, of the discipline, I think. So maybe what the question is on the table is, is uh, how should people be thinking about these things that may be um, ostensibly race neutral in a particular discipline or department, but actually do have the effects of perpetuating ways of approaching topics that either mischaracterize or fail even to recognize the kind of topics we're, we're talking about. So um, I just asked the question, so I'm not gonna answer it. I guess I'll turn it to any one of you who wants to take that on. Well, I guess maybe I'll just say super quickly that um, when I was in graduate school, one of my colleagues petitioned to have Jamaican Creole, which she was studying Caribbean lit, um, count for her quote unquote foreign language. Um, she herself was actually West Indian. Um, and so these questions of, uh, again, the scholarly languages, um, I'm not saying don't know them, right? But, but they have that tradition um, that Tricia just laid out for us so nicely. Um, again, of, of what are the languages to know and those two, you know, came to us out of a particular um, hierarchy of where we thought scholarly thought and in what language scholarly thought happens. Yeah, I think the, thank you. I, I think the, um, the matter of language acquisition and Jennifer, your comments really got me here is that really it's, it's, it's supposed to signify one of the tools that's needed to get at the thing that you want to get at inside of uh, the, the, your particular training. And so, you know, I also was trained in media studies, a fairly new kind of 20th century invention of a discipline, wherein things like knowing code was a, a way to, you know, su to suffice in your language requirement. And so I think these kinds of questions, as, as Steve put it, that are seemingly uh, 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 race neutral, but also get at a kind of larger philosophical orientation of what it means to do graduate curriculum in which the case has to be made. Why X in the service of what you are aiming to do um, both in terms of your question, but also in terms of the container of the program that you happen to be sitting in while you do your work now. Eita, do you want to take a shot at this? I mean, you, you may- I don't have anything to add. No, Steve, you go ahead too. I, I don't, I, please, I don't have anything. Please go ahead with your questions. Um, well, you know, I wonder if this also uh, relates to another question that was asked, which is, essentially what students might be doing um, if they're working in a, in a field, in a department, in a so-called discipline in which the issues that we've been talking about centering race, um, you know, haven't really made it to their fore. Any thoughts uh, for any students in the audience who may be struggling um, with these, you know, very specific questions in their own departmental home, whether those are undergraduates or graduate students? I actually have a, can I jump in? Yeah, yeah. You know, at Toronto, I run the Center for Diaspora and Transnational Studies, a new, so we set it up. It's now like 15 years old. And uh, so I was at the University of Toronto before I moved, I jumped around and got to Stanford. And this question came up all the time. Why diaspora studies? And one of the things that I pointed out to my students is that every respectable institution these days has a... Uh, uh, a diversity, they'll, they'll call it different things. They have a diversity uh, uh, office uh, and they're interested in diversity. So that for example, banks, many banks have found out that as new immigrants uh, arrive and settle, new immigrants are very interested in putting down roots by buying homes. So every bank has a diversity officer whose interest is in targeting uh, marketing products to uh, uh, newly arrived uh, immigrants. And some banks are more successful than that. But as someone who has done uh, critical race studies, 
can not only shape the direction of these products, but also give the bank a higher, as it were, consciousness on these things. Let me jump to another completely ridiculous example, FIFA, the, the football federation is very much about, uh, they say so themselves, so we can take them on their word, uh, equity, the distribution of uh, resources to various leagues, to uh, historically uh, marginalized populations and so on. What better than someone who has done critical race studies to go and work at FIFA and tell them that you are looking at the thing completely wrong. And from my train, in other words, there are many, and the more um, we produce uh, students who are savvy and understanding of critical race studies, and the more impact that they make in different industries and so on, the more value will be given to our fields. So this is one answer that I used to give to my students in diaspora and transnational studies. So they need you. Just tell them you are here and they will, they will hire you. Yeah, I'm wondering if I could uh, jump in for a second, uh, Otto, and just ask um, some of my colleagues here a couple of questions um, about what they imagine would be some important new areas to move in, in terms of their centers or things they have on tap for the people who joined us today to say, you know, you know, what, what are we going to do with the space that we have? Um, it, you know, maybe it's programming for next year, maybe it's envisioning something five years down the road, maybe it's uh, challenges, maybe, you know, whatever it is, but I think sort of what, what are we going to do that we're either excited about that we think is going to change uh, the, the sort of landscape of where we are or what, what kinds of things do you wish you could do and do you just can't see your way right now? But I think it's important to kind of, you know, imagine a future together I and mean, any, anyone, Jennifer, Riley, Steven, I can jump in. I have, um, this is an opportunity to say how excited I am to be working with the, the, the colleagues here on this uh, Centering Race Consortium um, that was funded by the Mellon Foundation. So one thing I would say very positively that I think we're really excited about doing is looking for ways to partner with other colleges and universities to expand the sense of community, the good ideas, um, the, the opportunities to think together about issues that are just so critical, that we all agree are critical. There's just not enough, um, not enough of us to go around on any given campus and we need one another's support and good ideas. Uh, we need to be able to create opportunities for one another. We need, we need critical feedback from one another that we may not get in our, on our home campuses. So, you know, the chance to work with, um, with the colleagues on this call and with others around, you know, uh, you know on, on these campuses is really exciting to me. Um, and we're hoping to be able to, to, to do this, you know, with faculty involved, with students involved, with artist residents in, involved. And so I'm really excited about that. One thing that I'm concerned about, and I don't know if any of the rest of you are struggle with this, is that our center has gotten pulled in on our campus to institutional efforts related to diversity, equity, uh, and belonging, right? The DEIB efforts. Um, and in some ways we wanna be there, you know, because I do think that the work, the kind of intellectual work that we do, the kind of uh, the credentialing and um, amplifying of work in these areas as critical areas of research and teaching does translate to questions of climate. It, you know, there's a relationship between um, ennobling these fields and who gets hired and who stays um, on a given campus. So there's reasons why we wanna be in, involved in, in this work. At the same time, there are sets of challenges, I think here when, a, when, when academics like, like me and I think like all of us um, get pulled into these conversations and the committees about tone setting on campus, you know, best practices on campus. Um, that are you know, not related to the kind of research and teaching and other things that I think we're, we're primarily focused on. So I'm just flagging that as an area of uh, challenge for us. Um, and I didn't know if anybody else um, had any thoughts about that. So I've given you the positive, which is the consortium, that's one thing. And then I'm kind of raising the question of, of how, if and how our centers have a role to play in these broader university efforts. I, I don't want to be an HR specialist, for example, right? And I feel sometimes like I do get pulled into that stuff 
if, uh, and our center does. And if we get pulled into that, we're not doing other important work that we could be doing. So uh, if that's of interest, we could, maybe somebody wants to comment on that. Jennifer or Riley, anybody? Well, the, the thing is that um, one of the reasons why Stanford, I'm, I have to talk about Stanford, Jennifer, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm new, I'm only two, two years at Stanford. Uh, why the recruitment and retention of uh, faculty of color has been a problem is specifically because, not just because of the tone, Stephen, what you just mentioned, the tone, but also because for some reason, the, the numbers don't, they never are able to grow because people come and, they, and then they leave, you know. So uh, our being pulled into these things uh, distracting though they might seem, sometimes almost inescapable, because we want to increase uh, the density of, of faculty of color. But to, to, to increase the density and the numbers, we have to somehow contribute to uh, creating the environment where the faculty of color arriving sees themselves in it. This is especially crucial for pre-tenure faculty. So senior faculty like me, I'm at home everywhere. It doesn't really matter. But for you, I can imagine if I had arrived as a, a pre-tenure, I would have been scared for the rest of my seven years, you know, before I got tenure at Stanford. Because they don't, the history of uh, the tenuring of a faculty of color, let's just say in the English department, it's, let, let's put it very yeah, diplomatically, it's suboptimal. And this is putting it dip diplomatically. So in a way, you, you almost cannot escape, uh, escape it. I think you've put it in uh, managerial terms and that was my gesture towards the global university, but like University of Chicago, um, we at Stanford suffer from not having a department, for example, of African and African American studies before I too was hired as a full professor over 10 years ago at Stanford. I was a full professor in African and African American studies 100%. So the kinds of reach and interdisciplinarity and centering race that we've talked about um, was very much uh, a given and um, understood uh, and valued. And you know, we are like University of Chicago fighting. Uh, and as you well know, Otto, because you've been a wonderful part of that, um, not only to have a department, it may be a department of ethnic studies, I don't know what the landscape will look like, um, but also an institute, because it's at Stanford that institutes um, have great value, um, at literally in, in terms of resources uh, and scope. Uh, and hiring more people so it's not the same few. You know, the numbers of black faculty at Stanford have remained uh, statistically flat since the 1980s. Um, and I think that is in part because we've invested in fact too much in junior people, which is continuing to happen, who are brilliant and wonderful, uh, but don't necessarily have the wherewithal to um, you know, compartmentalize and know a landscape or understand even necessarily what a university is about. You know, that's a huge transition. And we're not taught in graduate school to do this kind of DEI or DEB work. Um, and so it's again, the burdens of representation that fall too often on the bodies that always already um, are uh, laboring at a, a certain kind of personal expense. So we need to do uh, more of that structural change that all of the, everyone on the call was talking about to really uh, make it uh, better labor conditions and really change the face of the university. Um, if I could jump in, Riley, unless you were about to jump in. Well, go ahead, Tricia. Oh, okay. I just wanted to piggyback for a second because I just, my favorite thing about Zoom is that you can like quickly surf the internet before you say something. So I want to say that Stanford's Black faculty are 2% of the faculty. So let's just think about the numbers we're talking about. So mm -hmm. when we're saying, well, they leave, it doesn't actually matter. You can't fix the climate with 2%. So and for Black women, it's 1%. Oh, great. It's 1%. Well, the internet needs to go catch up. That's why I acknowledged I went to the Stanford website. So then in case it was incorrect, I wasn't going to be held responsible. But that's an unbelievable failure, right, in numbers, right? It's easy for me to say that because I'm not at Stanford. But this is extremely important. Uh, you know, of course, there's going to be climate issues. I'm sure 
when they're calling Steve in to say, can you discuss it? It's all about, we can't afford to lose any more or whatever the problem may be. But, you know, this is a, a real problem. <laughs> I mean, like we just can't stand around and act like we're, we're all doing all this. And everyone is black, isn't doing race work either necessarily. So when you bring those numbers down, you have to bring, bring them down even further. Um, and I don't think, I just want to comment on Steve's really important point about diversity work. That climate stuff is the university's job. And um, there are lots of talented people who do this for a living and they need to be invested in and all the, all the faculty and staff need to be participating in what to do with that. But certainly there's some intellectual work that overlaps and dovetails with that. And I get called to do the same thing you're talking about. Some of my own research on systemic racism overlaps so I can just stay to my research and it still has a kind of DF effect. But you know, if that's not what you're doing, you shouldn't be called in there. Um, um, but just one last thing on the positive, because I love Steve as positive, negative. I have to end with the positive because my negatives outweigh the positives all the time. Um, so the, my positive is not only that this has been super exciting for the four schools to think this way, but that we've really been empowered to create, you know, cross-university curricula and cross-university teaching. And I think we should, I'm empowered, I'm inspired, and our grant empowers us to really do that. And I think that's super important because not only will that help our various one to two percent um, be in community, but it will also just create a, a kind of collective knowledge uh, and, and expand all of our work much more quickly. So. This is, you know, Zoom, the sort of crisis of the pandemic, creating a virtual world as the norm and the context of the grant and the geniuses who were speaking yesterday and those of you who are in the audience here, you know, this is a really exciting moment where we can take this work, make it public, make it shared uh, and push forward. Let me say something else that's exciting, you know, I kind of made this reference earlier to the kind of politics of small numbers. Um, you know, this is the this is this is this is the flip side of you know that one percent that we're talking about at Stanford. Or I often say, like, I'm one of three Mexican American faculty members I know at, at Yale, and I'm married to the number two. You know, and so there's only one who I'm not married to um, on our campus. So anyway, so small numbers, right? Um, but the flip side of that is what we do know is that in working with students, uh, with colleagues, if, if we can make differences in their lives, right, if we can help to bring that one extra person um, to our campus or help them to get that seminar paper done or get that master's thesis or that doctoral dissertation done or keep that, uh, keep that colleague who was hired on our campus but you know, is considering a move. If we can make a positive addition to any of those moments in those people's lives, they can, these can have remarkable effects on our fields, on the departments or the units in which they're working, on the students that they're that they're that they're working alongside with. Whether we're talking about a student or we're talking about you know uh, you know a, a faculty member, you know um, we work with far more than small numbers in our centers. That's certainly true. But when we succeed individual by individual by individual, I think you know we can have um, you know kind of really important multiplying effects um, that ought you know ought, ought to be recognized and. Um, uh, so that's one of the things that makes me happy because when I, you know, it, it's it's in this work, there are moments where you feel set back by the, the larger atmosphere in which we're working. I could have told stories, um, you know, about that as I know everybody on this call could have. And yet at the same time, we are able to hold on to, I think, um, these experiences with, um, with, 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 small, with small groups of people or even with individuals that we know really do have, have made a difference. And just looking at the, the you know, at you, Jennifer O'Reilly and Tricia, knowing some of the faculty you've supported, the students you've supported, you know, it's amazing to see the work that you've done with those people over time and the way in which your investment of time, um, you know, your trust in their projects, the leadership you've given really has, you know, made a really important difference to, to people on your campuses, but also well off your campuses. I just saw a question here, Riley, sorry to interrupt, but it's an important one, I think. It's uh, from one of the, 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 the participants. Uh, is the consortium open to HBCU collaborations? And this is a question for you guys. 
That is the hope. We were um, charged by Mellon with these four institutions, but I think our goal um, is to work not only with HBCUs and indigenous colleges, community colleges, which there's a push to make those free now, which would be wonderful, but other kinds of institutions. Uh, I think Steve mentioned museums, um, places of uh, where folks are incarcerated and education is happening. So I think that there is, um, and that's a lead in for tonight's wonderful connected event to Reginald Dwayne Betts uh, and uh, his interview with eViewing tonight, but um, that we really hope this is the seed um, that's going to grow and connect. And we absolutely um, welcome partnerships and we'll be actively seeking them out. I was gonna say that earlier when Steve was saying, what are you looking forward to? And I'm saying, looking forward to working with even more folks. So Riley, I sorry to have interrupted you. I thought that was a, a, an important question to bring up. So I interrupted you, Riley. Please, yeah, please. no, I mean, I think I think I, um, uh, Jennifer really answered that and also gave me another occasion to say that I hope that you will join us for uh, the CSRPC's annual public lecture, which is also the closing plen plenary for this uh, uh, Racial Reckonings in the Future of the Humanities Conference uh in just about an hour from now so i hope that many of you will be able to to come back uh for that but i, I also was really uh just sitting with um you know steve's um and and i think this is this is perhaps also uh inclusive of what does it mean to think about opening the consortium or collaborating um across a whole a whole host of different institutional sites which is that you know i was really like yeah, you know, often when we talk about kind of um, uh, grief, tragedy, deficit, we think about it as cumulative and compounding. But we also might want to attend to the ways that um, there are other kinds of collective energy that can have a kind of cumulative effect. And so I really heard that inside of um, what I think is the real aim um, of, of the work that we've been doing at the Center in Race Consortium and the real desire for it as it grows over the course of the next several years and hopefully beyond. Well, uh, last, um, last remarks. Uh, I think we have uh, some two minutes to go. So final remarks, uh, 30 seconds each, uh, starting with Tricia. Okay, um, you know, couple of quick points. Uh, ideas really matter. And this work, no matter how marginal it may appear, can have an outsized effect. Uh, and, uh, you know, I have, a, I have a tremendous sense of hope when I look at my students and my colleagues and all there is. And I just want to push us forward and see as many obstacles as we need to see to, to make as much space as possible. And we hope that we'll work with many of you in this, uh, in the audience today to, to make that happen in the future. Jennifer? I put it in the chat already, but I do believe that there is joy and strength in this kind of collective work and to know that you're not the only one anywhere uh, laboring singularly, but rather we are all looking to do this work and all of it really does make a difference and matter. So I'm grateful, thank you. Uh, Riley? Yeah, no, before joining uh, or getting into graduate school, I was in, an organizer and there's so much of what it means to, to direct the center where I feel like I'm drawing on every available toolkit here, precisely because there are so many people who rightfully have a stake in uh, the center's business and activity. And so I'm, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to work uh, with those folks, as well as to work uh, a collaborative across these universities. Um, you know, there is, a lot of work to be done. And I think the centers and the CRC, CRC has been uh, a great uh, site from which to think about doing the good work that's available. And Stephen, finally. Yeah, I just want to thank everybody. I mean, we're, if the struggle is long, right, we all are running centers aware that, you know, we inherit struggle that's de decades old within our, on our campuses and beyond our campuses and in the broader educational system. And I think we're at an important moment um, as we work together and collaborate, hopefully with people who are, 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 are witnessing and um, in the audience today to sort of think about changing higher education at this moment. I mean, we need, we have, there's a lot of work to do to catch up to the realities of the world, to serve the people um, that we want to serve. 
and to be agents of change in the ways that um, you know our centers, but more broadly our campuses ought to be um, ought to be agents of exchange. So thank you all. So thank you all. This has been magnificent. I've learned a lot. And so thank you very much. So uh, Megan, is there anything you wanted to add before we? No, we're all set. Thank you everybody for joining today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for moderating.